Okay, hi. So, yeah, like uh, Dr. Knight said, I'm Geraint. Um, doing my PhD in operational research. And what, one area that I'm looking at is queuing theory. And I'm going to explain a bit about why we do that, and also a library that um, is built in Python to simulate queuing systems. So this, I don't know if you can see very well, this was the queue for the book sign-in yesterday. And I had a few other options of what other queues I could have shown on you. So there was the dinner queue, which unfortunately for me was a really nice queuing system, so I couldn't take a photo of it. There was um, the queue for the micro bits. Yeah, there was a queue for the bar at the conference dinner. So all these queues just in one conference like this. Where else do queues occur in the real world and why are they important to study? So something we look at in Cardiff is healthcare systems and uh, waiting lists are queues. There's queues going to A and E. You can model patient flows around the system as a system of queues. So also think about uh, call centres. Why there's queues um, on when you ring up, you join a queue to get be answered. Why is that important to study and be optimised? So it could obviously cost the company a lot of money to hold people on the phone. When you when you ring up, uh, if there's ten people in the queue, they, it's going to cost them for each amount of people in the queue. If they can optimise their system so that the queue length is less, it could save them a lot of money. Obviously, with healthcare systems, you're not so much saving money, but you're thinking about saving lives, saving, uh, optimising uh, work schedules for people. You're thinking about, um, yeah, obviously NHS money as well. So how do we go about analysing these and thinking about getting some information to be able to optimise? So what we do, we make models of queues. And I've got this picture here. <laughs> Some of you are laughing, but this is a genuine model of a queue. So you've got... <laughs> if we play with this model, we know the rules are that if you join a queue, you've got to stand behind whoever's in front of you. you spend some time in service and everyone moves forward. And we can look at measuring some performance measures like queue length, how long on average people stay in this queue, and so on. And we can sort of parameterize this model from a real system. We know that superheroes generally join queue at a rate of, say, 10 every day. They get served. I don't know why they get served. They, for buying capes, they get served at sort of <laughs> two every day. Let's have a look at what the, what the, how long a superhero has got a queue for. Now if we go, what if all superheroes who can fly always go to the front of the queue before everyone else? <laughs> Okay, so now I can say, I can play with this model and put that rule in, and even though I've never seen that system in real life, because um, I've never seen superheroes fly to the front of the queue, I can say, if that system were, was in real life, what would the queue in length be? How would the queue in length dif differ for people who fly and people who don't fly? And this is, might be a silly example, but this is what we do when we build models. Two ways operational researchers go about doing this is by building mathematical models of queues, which is very, very nice to get what we call exact methods, and get we can say what exactly what the mean sort of queuing time is, what the mean queue length is going to be. And we have simulation. And we tend to use simulation for systems where the mathematical models might be too hard, or it might be you know, a lot, a lot going on. It might be a big network, like a hospital. So we, we look at simulation, and sometimes we can use simulation to verify your mathematical models as well. So, I've been talking a lot about queues. What actually is a queue? This is how I'm going to represent a queue. We have customers arriving randomly, but at a rate of about lambda every time unit. They join a queue, they wait in line, and until they get to the front of the line. Once they're at the front of the line, they spend some sort of time with a server. So a service time, which is random, but derived from a distribution. And then they leave. Okay, and they, these are the, these are uh, the sort of the building blocks to these queuing systems. You can then look at a network of queues. So here we've got two queues. One, as you can see, has got multiple servers, two servers, so one queue going to two tills. The other one at the bottom has got a limited queuing capacity. 
So that means only 10 people can queue. If, more, if the 11th person wants to come, they'll get turned away. Okay? And we've got them arranged in a network. So that means that once you finish service, there's some sort of probability of either rejoining the queue, moving to another queue, or leaving the system. Okay? And uh, I hope you can imagine then that if, we, if say, one of these queues was A&E, one of these queues was a ward, one of these queues was a GP, we can start building up sort of real systems, like hospital systems, and model flows of patients this way. One interesting thing here is that blocking can occur as there's limited queuing capacity. So if someone wants to go from, if wants to transfer from one queue to the other queue, and the queue is full, what happens? They get blocked. They remain with a server until room becomes available. And you can imagine, that you hear in the news a lot about bed blockers, this, this sort of thing can happen. So we've got a Python package called Q with C-I-W, which is Welsh for a Q. <laughs> we, we've got this Python package where we can easily just define our parameters and then simulate the Q, rather than actually go ourselves and code up a simulation. I want to show you an example of how we'd uh, simulate a network like this of Qs. So, put this way, we've got... Uh, like Python author, I can show you some code. So, in the first bit, I'm just importing the libraries. The most important one here, import code. Everyone should do that. <laughs> okay. So now, I, to be able to create a simulation, we need to define our parameters. With code, we define them in a structured way and using this dictionary of parameters here. So, there's lots of nested dictionaries. And we can see that, logically, this... Uh, defines our system. So the first thing we've got is arrival distributions. What I mean by arrival distribution is that when you join a node or a queue, the time in between consecutive arrivals is random, but it comes from some sort of distribution. And I've got to say what distribution that is. So I'm going to say arrival distributions, and then I've got another dictionary. This dictionary, its keys are classes, not a Python class, a customer class. And that customer class is labelled 01. So we can have lots of different types of customers going around our system. <coughs> so class 0 customers, at its first node, so node number 1, as we've labelled it, it has an exponential distribution with parameter 5. Okay, I'll explain more about distributions later. And then, at its second node, they arrive with an exponential distribution and a different parameter. And the same for the different class of customers. So you've got two classes of customers, two nodes, and we can define all the arrivals in this dictionary. Next, we've got service distributions. This is how long do they spend in service, and where does that distribution come from? Class 0 customers, again, we've got at node 1, they spend exponential 7. So it's random, but from that distribution, and node 2, and the same with class 1. Transition matrices, then. These are the probabilities of going from one queue to another queue. So, class zero customers, they go from, here, they go from, they leave node one and go to node one with probability zero. They leave node one and go to node two with probability 0.5. Leave node one and go to, no, sorry, leave node two and go to node zero with probability 0.5 and so on. And the same then with class 1 customers. Then, independent of class, we can define number of servers at each node. It's to do the architecture network, not the classes. We just say at the first node, there's five servers or five beds. The second node, there's two servers. That's, that's the hard bit about simulating. And it's, I, wouldn't, I, I don't want to call it hard either. It's just defining your network correctly. And then, I'm setting a seed so we can reproduce these results. Creating a network object, which is how Q reads in these parameters, and then creating a simulation object that's going to run the simulation, I'm going to simulate for 100 time units. Yeah, let me run all these. Um, oops. Run that. Simulated. Now I can collect all the records of that simulation. A record is one yeah, a record, a data point of each customer's service at each node. 
There could be lots of these because you can go to repeatedly go to nodes. So get all your records, and then using list comprehension, I can get all the waiting times and plot the weights. And you can plot the weights of this system. That's the overall weights. If I only want to look at the weights of the second node, I can just filter out the weights of the first node using this comprehension, and I can get it in. So that's the most basic queuing system. Queue has lots and lots of features built in uh, so that you can simulate more and more complex systems. And I'm going to show you the documentation for Queue here, which is here. You can see features here, and there's a list of various features you can add to your Queue network. So not only increase complexity, but increase reality while you're simulating reality. Another cool thing, which I think is cool, I'm going <laughs> to translate it all to Welsh, which is very important for us in Wales. So I'm going to go through one or two of the features now. First of all, distributions. I was, I was talking about this exponential distribution, which is this, dis sorry, this distribution here. This is how we, the default we go to mathematically, because it's a nice distribution to play with. But it doesn't really reflect reality. If you look at, think about service times, this distribution says that service times close to zero have got a really high probability, and like, services actually take time. You know what I mean? so, some people might think a better one would be like a no log normal distribution. So close to zero is quite a low probability, but then you still have that same shape. This here is a uniform distribution, so it's just equally likely, uh, equally likely to sample any number between between a range. And then this is a more custom distribution where I've just got four values that can get sampled with any pro with pro given probabilities. All of these. I've chosen them so that they have roughly the same mean and variance, but they're going to give different results. So I'm going to show you how we go about implementing that in, in Queue. Service distributions. So hopefully this might this will be familiar with what we had before. Oops, sorry. So here I'm cho choosing service distribution exponential parameter 10. I'm going to simulate, and I'm only going to look at service times, and it's going to plot all the service times of that distribution, and we get that distribution, which I showed you on the slide. Now I'm going to look at the log normal distribution, which is we get rid of the ones before the really close to zero, because they are quite unrealistic. All I've done is replace this exponential with a log normal, and log normal takes two parameters now. So I can define that, run my simulation, get all the weights, get all their service times. Same with the uniform distribution between two, a, a range. Simulate that and get the weights. And with a custom distribution, what, what I do here is I say, with probability 0.4, I'm going to sample the value 0.04. Probability 0.3, I'm going to sample the value 0.09. And so on until I reach 1. This again. Longer and we get our histogram of service times. Just to show you that we're only we're only sampling them service times I've defined there. I'm looking at the count, and these are the only service times any customer has had. What's interesting here is obviously Python uses floating point numbers. These are not quite exact, which is not a problem in general in simulation because you're always using random numbers. If it's not exact, random doesn't really matter. If you are, if you do need things exact because sometimes these can cause problems, especially when you um, combine this with some of the other features I've got. Q does have an exact option, which uses exact arithmetic, but that does slow things down a lot, a lot. So I wouldn't recommend using that unless you really, really need to. Okay. Now, I presented something similar to, the, to this before about Q in Python Namibia, actually, and someone came and said, what about people who push into Qs? And I was like, no, people are not allowed to do that. We don't like queue pushers. <laughs> but, but priority queues, you've got, uh, with priority queues, if you think about hospital systems, A and E, you want to let people with more severe injuries go before you. We can simulate this using priority queues. So we've got your um, two arrivals, and everyone at this arrival gets served before. With queue, this is simply mapping classes to priority code to priorities. So we've got 
uh, our similar system to the first first one. This is without any priorities, just two classes of customers. And I'm going to simulate this and show all the weights of the two different classes. And they've got similar weights because everyone's mixed up. Now all I'm doing here is adding this line, which is mapping class 1 to priority 1, class 0 to priority 0, 0 being more priority than 1. I do this, and we can see that class 0 weights a lot less because they're always pushing into the front of the queue. And this adds another layer of reality to your, net, to your networks. Balkin. Balkin is when you arrive at a queue, and you're like, that queue's too long. I can't be bothered to wait. I'm just going to leave it. The service is not important enough to me to wait. So what happens here? I've got a little diagram that says, you have arrivals. They make this decision. Is the queue too long or not? And every customer is going to have a different sort of threshold for that. And then they leave. This is modeled using a bulking function. So the probability of bulking, given that there are X number of customers already in the queue. And we can just input this straight into queue. So to show you how complicated these can get, I've just got this piecewise function that says if there's less than two people in a queue, that less than or equal to two people in a queue, then there's a probability x over 20 that they're going to bulk, that they're not going to join the queue. But as there's more people in the queue, so between 2 and 10, x over x plus 3. I don't know why I chose this, just to show how complicated it is. And otherwise, if there's more than 10 people in the queue, they always bulk, probability 1 of bulking. How do we do this in Q? And then go define our bulking function. So I've got the PyCon bulking function. So we, obviously, this is just a Python function. We can make this as complicated as we want. I've got two sets of parameters, one without bulking, and one where I've just added a bulking function, where I'm just inputting that function in. Now I'm going to, I'm running the simulation lots of times, getting an average, average weight. And without bulking, people are waiting. A 0.4 of a time unit with bulking, people are joining the queue less, we expect a less, less waiting to get 0.1. So that's very simple. All we've done is add that one line to the parameters dictionary. And then the last feature I want to quickly go over is server schedules. So at the top I've got a timeline, and this is my system. There's three servers. During I don't know if you can see the shade into well here, but during this time, time interval, we have three servers. During that time interval, then, it drops to one server. In that time interval, we haven't got any servers. Everyone's gone on holiday. At the, this time interval, we've got two servers. But then that all repeats, because things work on a cycle. Then three, one, zero, two. How would you put this into code? Hang on. Skipped a bit there. So this is, uh, so we got these servers coming off and on, but during the crossover periods, what happens? So if I'm currently getting served and someone's due to go on holiday, they're not going to leave me. I haven't let them do that. That is an option I want to add in the future, but we haven't let them do that. So what happens is that during the crossover time, if someone's busy, they've got to keep on working until they finish their current service. Okay? Another thing you'll notice about this diagram is that if I'm going from three servers down to one server, two of them don't go on holiday, all three of them come on, go on holiday, and a new server comes along. So if everyone was busy, we could have a period of actually having four servers there, even though I've never said to have four servers. So it's a total shift change. How do we do this in code? Then I've I define something called a schedule, so I define, define my own, PyCon UK schedule, where for 10 minutes, one person's going to be on duty, the next 10 minutes is not, not going to be on duty. And then it repeats, the so next 10 minutes, one person's on duty, next 10 minutes, nobody's on duty. And when I'm talking about number of servers, then I just put in my schedule. Then I'm going to run this and look at the weights, and we get weights that look like this. And we can actually interpret this and put it back to the schedule. So when, when people are on, when they're someone on duty, we're not getting that many arrivals, and the, service, the services are really quick. So there's hardly any wait, there's hardly any queue. When there's nobody on duty, you've got to wait until someone comes back on duty. 
and that could be up to 10 minutes. So that's why you get the, a lot of customers around you with a long queuing time. Okay. Um, latest project with queue has been to look at visualizing the data that comes out. So I've been using Matplotlib there. And that's very, very nice to look at whatever exactly you want to look at. If you want a nice overview of what happened in the simulation, what can we do? So I've uh, made this, it's not Python, but it's uh, HTML and JavaScript app, Covers, and I can load in some transformed data. So I've got a program that transforms the, the data from Q into JSON files. And I've then got this, this nice visualization tool where I can look at all the histogram of the weights, the time series of the weights, um, the Q length, and so on. And here I can say I want to only look at customers at node 2 of class Z. Zero. I can then get that histogram. So that gives you a nice tool that you can play with and really understand what happened in your simulation before you then really dive dive into what you need to do. So this Co has had two academic uses so far. Um, actually, one other academic use since since this slide was originally written. But um, so the first one has been work that I, I've done with Dr. Knight and my other supervisor, uh, Professor Harper. I was looking at a theoretical piece of work investigating deadlock in queuing networks. I'll explain a bit more. And another one was a, also at Cardiff. It was a practical piece of work by Dr. Jenny Morgan and an exchange student, Lika, who were looking at modeling a real ophthalmology clinic at Cardiff and Vale Health Board and using the results of this to inform and strategize scheduling. So deadlock, um, I mentioned briefly at the start about blocking, about there's only certain, you can only have 10 people queuing in the queue before people get turned away. This is what's happening here. We've got queue here, only four people can queue, only three people can queue, people get blocked. And what's happening is this guy's getting blocked to the middle queue, but both these guys are getting blocked to the top queue. So they're waiting on each other. There's a circle of waiting, they're all waiting on each other. No more natural movement will happen. So what we looked at is, we'll, how can we detect when this is happening in the simulation? And we used a graph theoretical approach to look at knots. Um, we implemented this into Q to detect deadlocks. I've got this, this network, which is just one node with customers rejoining, but there's a certain capacity. And now I know that this reaches deadlock. So I've gone, my simulation now, I'm going to add a deadlock detector into it, which is built in. And then instead of simulating for a certain amount of time, I'm simulating until it reaches deadlock, and I'm going to record that time until it reaches deadlock. And this system, for this run of the simulation, took 1.3 time units to get to deadlock. So what we looked at uh, the effect of parameters on this, and we looked at the effect of the service rate on the time to deadlock, and we got my favorite graph in the world, which is all nice and, <laughs> nice and lined up and nice and interesting, and I won't go into that. The, just very briefly, the other academic project was a practical project, and there was three ophthalmology clinics, but one waiting list. And these ophthalmology clinics uh, opened and closed at different times. And we, we simulated this using uh, two nodes. So one node was a delay for people who got told to come back in six months, come back in a year. And one node, which is the waiting list itself. Each server was a clinic, and using the server schedules I showed you earlier, people could come on and off duty and got some uh, nice practical results out of that. Um, so this is my first thank you slide. So this thank you slide is saying thank you to every bit of software I've used, every, everyone who's funded my PhD, every conference I've been to and given me inspiration for things. So thank you to everyone there, and thank you to you, and you can find all the information here. Thank you. <laughs> Have you uh, tried using this with a with a, just a, like a web app? Because uh, you know, web apps often need to do work in the background, you know, using Celery or Huey or some other Python project. 
Um, that sounds like you could maybe test out your possible architectures uh, before you sink in three days into configuring one of these. Um, uh, no, I haven't thought about that yet, so thank you, a really good idea. Um, one thing we were trying to think of was a way of getting nice user input so people who don't know Python to input data and then feed that back into QViz and visualize it. So that, that might be one interesting way of going about that. Thank you very much. Sort of a follow-on question because I'm interested in the same thing. So uh, there's a lot, you know, there's queuing all over the place in internal uh, data systems. Yeah, but so, but uh, how how much have you scaled this? I mean, so the, these are really interesting problems, but they're people, so there's fairly small number of people. How fast does this work? You know, if you were talking about tens of thousands of messages or, or more, you know, going through a, some some connection of queues. Um, so we haven't. I haven't sort of stress tested it yet, but um, we can run it for a very long amount of time. But we've only really tested on small networks. We know it sort of fails when you are you want something with ten thousand servers and order ten thousand servers. But ten thousand customers going through that does we have that does happen in small networks even. So it might yeah, it might be something something to think about definitely. Order here, so. I was just one. <laughs> yes, <but> very well done. <laughs> uh, have you simulated um, flood situations where there's suddenly an enormous increase in the, the number of incoming customers on a small trickle queue? Uh, Slash dot exec. So no, we haven't. I currently haven't looked at. So I'm guessing I would model that as a a function of arrival rate to time. That's not something we've looked at, but it is quite recently an issue that's gone up, and I've got a solution in my head. I just haven't put it down to fight to get um, time-dependent arrivals, right. which would be really interesting. Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, so you've turned this into a module that other people, I presume, you would like them to use. Yeah. Who? Are these other people? Uh, so, are these professional academics like yourself? Or are these people in industry? Say, for example, a doctor or some administrator in a hospital working out how do I sort out my A and E department? Which one or both? Or I'd how do you address? I'd that? like everyone to use it, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no. In a, so, in operational research, which this would be an operational research tool, um, we do get very much get academics fractioneers, so people working in big businesses or healthcare management, and they do tend to work together a lot as well, so it would be nice that this could be something that you can just take out of the box and use, or an academic could do more research on, yeah. Right, I think there's probably more time we've got. Um, just want to give a talk to Joanne, and I'm sure she'll be able to keep us in touch. Any questions? But let's thank